So welcome to episode three of the Ox Files, Oxford United's look back at history. This week we are looking at 2015-16. Uh, joining me as ever is uh, Dan Curtis, whose balmy idea this was. How are you, Dan? Yeah, good thanks, good thanks. Lovely sunny day here in London. Good uh, And we've got club historian Martin Bradetsky. Martin, how are you? Well, I'm very well too, thank you. And it's also lovely and sunny here in Oxford. Will the cat be joining us this week? I don't think so, not this week. I think she had enough of last week's episode. Star of the show so far. Yeah. Uh, this week, not one, but two special guests. Uh, first of all, joining me all the way from the next room to where I'm talking to you right now, Derek Fazakari. Faz, how are you? Very good, thank you, Chris. Very good. Good. Not changed in the 10 seconds since I last saw you then. That's good. No, absolutely uh, not. And flooded in somewhere in North Wales. Look who's here. Hello, Jordan Evans. How are you? Hi, Chris. Yeah, yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, um, nice and sunny outside, the same, but yeah, flooded in up here, so a bit different uh, to everyone else's surroundings, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's that's serves you right for living uh, somewhere in North Wales. Uh, that's your own fault. Yeah. You're going to get the weather. Uh, Jordan, we'll come on and we'll talk about your time with Oxford United and the, the amazing story that you've got. Um, however, the, the format for this, for people at home uh, watching in, we will go through the season. We will look back at clips and videos. Uh, Dan, you're keen to stress it's not just official videos that we're using, right? No, it's, it's not. I'm trying to get some of the best footage I can find from YouTube. As you've seen with the previous two episodes, you know, there's some really, really great content out there about, about Oxford United's history. Some games you think you'd never see the goals from. Um, this season, obviously, we've got all the official videos, but I've tried to mix in some fan shots as well. Also slightly dreading it. Martin, you are expanding your role in this. Have you got a quiz? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, it's a quiz for nerds, mostly Oxford United uh, supporters who uh, know a little bit about the history of the club. Um, there's, uh, there's six or seven questions in total. Uh, write your answers down as we go, if you're watching this, and I'll give you all the answers at the end. It's kind of like Popmaster for, for idiots. The story starts, I think, with a trip that you were probably on, Chris. Um, <laughs> the trip to Austria. Um, tell us what happened here. Give, give us one story we've never heard before about the trip to Austria. Me and Faz had a lovely time walking uh, around Vienna, didn't we, Faz? It was uh, we did. really hot. Yeah. Um, I think... I Sorry, Chris, go on. Uh, go on. I, I was going to say, even getting there was a challenge because obviously we're going to Vienna, Austria, and trying to get Dan, Danny Hilton not to go to um, Venice, Australia. Everyone sort <laughs> of called him onto the right plane, I think. Yeah, I, I, I've got a little bit of context to it in that I had some part in playing in terms of selecting the venue. And obviously, from an Oxford United fan, this was our re-entry into Europe, having been denied a European place in 1986, was it, when they won the <laughs> yeah. um, League Cup? Was, have I got the dates right there, Chris? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I was asked if I'd go out and have a look at the training facility, and we were on a limited budget. I think the budget at the time was £15,000. Now, to take a group of players of 20 to 30 out for £15,000 to Austria was stretching it a little and so you can imagine that when we got there the place wasn't you know a five-star hotel or anything like that but being it the opportunity to get away for the first time in all those many years then uh, it was something that I thought the players would relish until they actually got there and said who's dragged us all this way out here so <laughs> a little bit of but uh, in the end it, it turned out to be an excellent venue and, uh, and, a, and a very good pre-season wasn't the most luxurious, was it? But um, I remember, um, I mean, the game that you've got on our screen here is one of the dullest games of football I've ever seen. But it was these scenes, wasn't it, with the flares? And I remember the people's faces as they walked over, the players coming over to uh, to salute the fans. The looks on like Johnny Mullins and Shay Dunkley's faces of what have we got into here? It was really quite something. And then. I went in one direction and Mr. Fazakley walked in the, the direction of Clumsy's Bar, which uh, <laughs> best draw a veil over that, I think. Yeah. Can that I ask is... a question about the pre-season here? Did you realise what a great team you had at your disposal here, Faz? Well, I think, in, in fairness, I think uh, the back end of the previous season, we started to show signs of 
what we could achieve. I think we'd sort of had a good run of, I don't know, seven or eight games where we might have gone sort of maybe one game, one defeat in those seven or eight games, something like that. And there was certainly um, a little bit of excitement leading up to the season on the back of what we'd done at the end of the last season and also with the players that we'd sort of uh, managed to bring in during the summer as well. So I think there was a... Um, a heightened expectation, certainly. Um, obviously, you 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 always start the season hoping and wanting for the best, and you never really know until you kick off what it is going to be like. But there was a good indications from what we'd done at the end of last season, certainly of the season previous to that. You hear a hammering. There's a room between me and Faz, and somebody's decided to take the roof off or something. It's, <laughs> it's going up. Martin, we missed your bit out. You are the club historian. What were the um, were there new faces or what have we done the season before? With, the expectation was quite high, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, well, the previous season, obviously, was Michael Apperson's first in charge and uh, started off a bit hesitantly, I think. People, players getting used to his style and everything. Uh, I think the watershed was the Cambridge away game, obviously, when uh, I think Michael suddenly realised that the system he wanted to play, the players weren't quite suited for it, and so he made changes. And uh, we went on a, a great run at the end of the season. I think we lost two of the last 17 and... Didn't lose any of the last eight, won five of them, and finished 13th place eventually. Uh, then in the summer, yeah, there were new faces. Obviously, you've mentioned a couple there. Um, but I think the most most significant new face was the permanent signing of Kamar Roof on a deal from uh, West Brom. Entirely uh, correct. Ken wasn't on that trip to Austria, but I, well, maybe he was. I think he may have been, actually, but um, he joined pretty soon afterwards. And then we kicked off on a beautiful sunny day against... Um, against Crawley and the, oh. So sorry, before you move on to the Crawley game, the first question in the quiz. Um, oh no. Yeah, you, you, you're probably the only one who will probably get this actually. Um, the pre the previous uh, pre-season tour outside the UK, previous, uh, last time Oxford United went overseas before the trip to Austria. Um, and to get a point, you have to name one of the opponents as well as the saying the, the, ven the venue for the tour. So, uh, do you want to uh, check answers or are we writing it down? No, you write it down and I'll give the answers at the end. You, you'll ruin it for the, the watching millions otherwise. How is Jordan sat in a flooded room in Wales supposed to get that just out of interest? Uh, I don't know how you Google skills, you Google Jordan. It. I, I, I should know my history, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I have, well, absolutely no idea. You should have an idea. You were there, I should, Did I go? Yes, you went. <laughs> did I? Oh, yes! <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was left holding the fort in Oxford while you uh, went off on your gallivanting around the world. Oh, legendary. I've got no more clues. No more clues. No more clues, no more clues right. So, first game of the season, beautiful hot sunny day, Crawley Town, and a slightly disappointing start. Defensive errors, I blame Fez. Danny Hilton's an interesting one, isn't he, Fez? Because I, I think Gary Wadder could sign him, hadn't he, before you and Michael came in? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, he was already at the club when I uh, arrived, yeah. Um, fantastic, Danny. He's, he's one of the most amusing players I've ever worked with. He's great. He was... Uh... I mean, he turned out to be an outstanding striker for us that season, but he could be the most frustrating person in the world as well. You know, some of his decision-making on a football pitch was similar to his de decision-making off the football pitch. <laughs> Sometimes he'd, I don't know, jump on a bus with car keys and wonder why he wasn't driving and stuff like that. You know? so, uh, <laughs> I remember him drawing, the referee was injured in the game and fell over and he grabbed the um, the marker paint that they do, the 10-yard thing, and drew the body around it like a murder scene. Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what a man. Uh, it, was, it was good company to be and always moaning, always groaning. Like I say, um, certainly a nuisance on a football field and the nice little habit of being able to wind the opposition up. And of course, he chipped in with his goals as well. And his work ethic was absolutely unbelievable. He'd run all day for you. There was absolutely no doubt about that. Um, 
and the only thing that he was worried about at all in his life was his hairline. Which is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, yeah. He's struggled with ever since. <laughs> he's, he's given up with battle now. He's got a shaved head, I think. But uh, uh, he, he watched the goal celebration. He does that. It's no good yeah. to listen to the podcast, but he pats his hair down for the pictures every time. Brilliant. Yeah. Jordan, he could have used you, couldn't he? He could have used your barbering skills. Yeah, I'm a barber, not a magician. So. <laughs> Very good, but that's not the game that I remember from the start of the season. The uh, yeah, there you go, brilliant. The game at Brentford. That's when I suddenly thought, okay, we are good. Um, Brentford were no slouches at that point, and then we really totally outplayed them, didn't we? I think we were about three goals up in about ten minutes, weren't we? Yeah. And then. Obviously, Kimar chips in with one from the halfway line, or not far from the halfway line. Is it here? I think. Yeah, this one. I should say as well, Ken needs to come on here at some point. But, um, his media duties up in uh, in Glasgow are, are pretty high. They they look at him. He's doing really well for himself. <laughs> Martin, is that you? Of course, that's why. How I got home. <laughs> Any Mullins? Magnus. <laughs> <laughs> Any Mullins started off scoring loads of goals, then he forgot how to do it, didn't he? he they called him Magnus, didn't they, for a while? Yeah, the Magnus. He's always there for goals. And... What's that, the League Cup? Yeah. Good, what was it like? What's it like after this game? Was there that kind of realization that wow, this this is a good team we've got here, Faz? Yeah, oh, definitely. I mean, obviously, still very very early in the season, and and but it was a sort of a marker for us and a marker for everyone else. I think that uh, you know, if we if we were to sort of sort of you know play to our potential, these were the sort of results that we could achieve. And obviously, Bradford at that particular time were. A league above us, I think. Um, don't think they were in the championship then. I think they were in League One then. But nonetheless, it went there uh, three goals up in the first 10 or 15 minutes, whatever it was, um, and continued to pretty much dominate the game and ended up winning 4 0. And it sort of set us on a path, I think. And it made a statement to everybody out there that, yeah, we were serious contenders. There's no doubt about that. This is a, the second question in the quiz. There's not too many, don't worry. This one's slightly harder. Uh, so before the game we just seen, uh, the question is when was the last time that Oxford had beaten Brentford? And for a bonus point, name the scorer in that game. Well, hmm. can we get the cat back on? <laughs> Next game, we are losing with minutes left. And then uh, our other striker pops up with this one. I remember him doing that because he misses it first time, doesn't I'm he? Sure. Yeah. Tell us about Pat Hoban, Faz. What was he like to work with? No, I mean, I, I thought he was uh, a little bit unlucky when he when he came to the club in terms of his goal his goal scoring return, really, because he used to hit these unbelievable strikes at times, and then somebody would get a fantastic block on the line. And it sort of, I think it wore him down eventually a little bit, you know, he started to feel a little bit sorry for himself. But he used to work hard, he could control the ball, hold it up, but he just didn't really um, get the number of goals that he probably deserved for his performances. But nonetheless, he had a, you know, a vital role to play in the team at that particular time alongside uh, Danny Hilton. And of course, while well, you've got Danny scoring goals, Kimaru scoring goals, uh, I think Liam Serkham started to chip in with goals, Callum O'Dowder. It wasn't so vital that we had another centre forward that was quite as pro prolific, but he, he, he was a great lad around the place. Uh, always came in with a smile on his face, you know. Just got a little bit disappointed that he didn't score the amount of goals that he probably should have done. The fact Not that all. the fact that oh. he's there, Faz, implies to me that you've got a Hilton, Hooban, front two. Where's Ken Roof's best position? Even now, where is his best position? Well, somewhere near the goals, that's for sure, because, <laughs> I mean, he played out in a wide position for us. He played as a number 10. He played alongside the striker. 
I mean, I think he's got the ability to play in any of the forward positions because he has got the ability to go past people if he was playing in wide areas. He has got the ability to score goals both with his feet and with his head um, if he was playing in a central position. So, you know, I think um, his preference would obviously be to play alongside a striker, I would think, where he'd have more opportunities to score. But you saw in the goal against that he scored against Brentford, the opportunity from that to distance to score a goal. Um, it was something he was always looking for and, and he was just a fantastic player for us at that particular moment in time and very fortunate to get him. Jordan, what was he like to play with, Kemal? Uh, I found him quite easy to play with because he always wanted the ball. If he ever played in front of me, he always wanted the ball um, and he, sort of, he, he knew when to dribble, when to pass it. Um, and he just had an eye or like a, a knack of being in the right place at the right time and scoring these goals. Like he scored loads of spectacular ones, but he also scored a lot of simple ones as well. So he just had, as, as Faz said, I think he just had that knack at the time of being, you know, in the right place at the right time. And to play with, he, he was, you know, for, for me, when I got my head up at left back, say, he was someone who always wanted the ball off me, which was, yeah, nice to have in front of you. Same thing with Callum O'Dowda, who played a lot of games left wing in front of you. Yeah, yeah, Callum was the same. Callum was a bit more of like, um, if he played on the left, he was more of like an old style winger because he was left footed playing on the left side. And with me, I used to be a winger when I was younger as well. So it was easy to play with Callum because we were similar sort of players in, in the fact that we could both play. If we both played on the wing, we'd play that old style sort of winger. Um so if I ever went round him, he would tuck in and vice versa. And yeah, he was he was easy to play with Callum, to be fair. Um, obviously lightning quick as well. So, you know, an intelligent footballer. Next question in the quiz. Uh, so uh, while he was at Oxford, uh, young Patrick had two loan spells away from the club, two different clubs. Uh, it's just one point, I'm afraid, but you have to name both clubs that he had loan spells away at. I feel like this is one I should know. Hmm. Uh, yeah, you might as well call this pointless because that's what I'm going to be at the end of this. <laughs> um, where's the sort of place he might have gone? Well, I can't tell you that. I can tell you the sort of place he might have gone, but where he didn't go, if that helps. A football club called O'Neill's. <laughs> <laughs> um, I haven't a clue. I'll put it there. Hmm. Oh, you talked about Kemal Roof. Mm. Going a man down. For those watching on the podcast, we're watching um, the game away at Bristol Rovers where the ball gets laid back to Kemal Roof, who... Oh, what a strike by Roof! Smashes it, basically. It was a great goal, wasn't it? This was late on as well, wasn't it? This was like with a few minutes left. Yeah, probably... I mean, I'd, I'd like to say about 88th minute or something like that, or even going into injury time. And it was a day where, to be fair, I think Bristol Rovers had pretty much dominated the game and then Kimar comes up with this one, an absolutely fantastic goal, fantastic strike. And that, as we were talking about, as Jordan was saying before, talking about a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the ability of Kimar to see opportunities and to score from all areas of the pitch. And there's no doubt about it. I mean, when you score goals like that, so late on in the game, that gives you the feeling that this season could really be special. And um, certainly it was one of the results that sort of uh, gave us a little bit of impetus going forward. There's no doubt about that. I came out of the shade of the stand, the press box at the top of the main stand, and we were sat in the shade. And I came out of there and all the Oxford fans were bright red because it was a really hot day. They were burning up on that terrace over there. Yeah. It was on Sky this match as well, wasn't it? Was there any clamour for Kemar Roof from, from bigger clubs at the time? He'd obviously had a great start to the season. He'd been scoring some spectacular goals. He'd had a great kind of finish to the end of last season. When were people starting to get interested in him? Was there any kind of... Had you had any contact from other clubs, Fez? Well, not, not to my knowledge, no. But, I mean, obviously, um, the way agents work these days... And don't get me wrong, I mean, I think we, we did a deal with West Brom, which was a good deal for West Brom. It was certainly a good deal for Kimar. And, of course, 
once he did sco- uh, start to score goals, uh, particularly as the season went on. And then obviously there was interest from other clubs and and obviously clubs higher up the leagues than, than, than what we were. And there was no doubt about it. We knew that we would have, if he continued in the same vein of form, which he did, then we, we would have a major problem keeping hold of him. But uh, in fairness, he came, he stayed for the season, did what we wanted of him and, and of course, achieved promotion. Are you surprised he's never played in the Premier League? Yeah, I am a little bit, you know, because you see uh, some of the qualities that he has and, uh, you know, as we were talking about before, you know, his ability, you know, to go past people, he can one-touch finishes, uh, long-range shots, tappings from inside the six-yard box. He has that uh, variety of goals in him. Um, and, of course, he's got the physical attributes as well. Plus the intelligence, as we were saying, you know, about being able to not only have the ability to beat players, but also play a simple pass and just running behind and 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 wait for the return. So they're a little bit surprised that he's, uh, you know, but I think he probably would have got the uh, the chance at Leeds, of course, because they got um, promoted. But he he took the opportunity at the end of his contract to move to uh, Belgian football. Next video, um, one of my favourite away performances ever, I think. I mean, I, I took my neighbour to this game, who's an Arsenal fan, and uh, he left afterwards saying, that's one of the best games of football I've ever seen. Um, it was amazing. Should we have a, should we have a watch? Brian Taylor is one of the most underrated strikers we've ever had. He didn't score many goals, but he set up so many and he held up the play. I thought Ryan was fantastic for us. But I was just about to say then, apart from obviously being your, in your opinion, the greatest ever performance, Dan, from a, an Oxford United team, I, the one thing that pleased the players and the staff about that day was obviously the result, which we took almost for granted in those days as we sort of started to get on a roll. But it was the fact that uh, Ryan scored his first goal because he was immensely popular in the dressing room. Uh, the, 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 the players loved him. The supporters took to him as well because he was a uh, 100% wholehearted player who had that handy knack of being able to leave one on a centre-half and get away with it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, he was an invaluable member of the squad at that time and, and probably didn't get as much credit as he deserved. What were opposition managers saying about your team at the time? So this is Teddy Sheringham in charge of Stevenage. Um, what did he say after the game? It was a little bit difficult after that game because they were locked in the dressing room for about an hour and a half and all you could hear was Teddy ranting and raving. So I don't know what he said after the game. We'd gone. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, I think... Most people were saying at that particular time that oh, we were the best team that, you know, they played that season, whoever we played. Um, and of course, you know, some of the score lines, as you say, I mean, four at Brentford, five at Stevenage, uh, a late goal at Bristol Rovers. We were sort of, I coined a phrase, I think that year, we were a team for all seasons, you know, um, and all conditions. And, and whatever we needed to do on the day to win a game, we managed to find it. Um, yeah, it was it was it was good, and, and and we were certainly feared by the opposition. There's no doubt about that, and um, and and you generally find that teams that are sort of on a good roll and and in the promotion spots, you know, you, you dig out results from 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 anywhere. I mean, as it was on this day, I think Stevenage were frightened to death of us before we even kicked off, and and soon, soon got our, goal, uh, our noses in front and and ran out five one winners at the end of the day. This was the first time I saw John Lundstrom play for us as well. Unbelievable control, the range of passing. I couldn't believe that he'd signed for us, to be honest. But if you remember, and Faz will back this up, it brought out the best in Danny Rose. Lunny couldn't get in the side because Danny Rose played so well for nine, ten games, just holding on to his place. It really brought out the best in Danny, I thought. Yeah. And there was competition as well. I mean, in the shot there, uh, Liam Serkham, who, who, you know, scoring goals from midfield. So for anybody to break into the team at that particular time, if you got injured or 
suspended, then the problem was, as it should be in all teams, is, you know, to win your place back. And the competition that we had obviously drove us forward as well. Another question. Uh, yeah. Two points up for grabs on this one. Um, the 5-1 away win was uh, the best away win in the Football League at the time. Um, so, uh, first question is... Uh, which teams had Oxford previously beaten by the same scoreline, 5-1. There's two. You get a um, point for naming either of them. And then uh, second follow-up question for another point. Uh, which other team did Oxford beat 5-1 away during this season that we're looking at now? Martin, was I at both those games? Uh, I don't know about well, the first two. I don't know. Probably not. I think, I think um, they might even predate you. Nothing predates me apart <laughs> <laughs> but you were definitely in the second part of the question. You were definitely that game. Are we ready to move on? Yeah. So the coldest day I think I've ever been. Oh, that was bitter. A football match. And again, we were clinging on a little bit. And then really late on, the roof man pops on in the top corner. But again, for podcast listeners, we're watching us win away at Dagenham. Uh, um, Yeah, I mean, that, that again shows his versatility. In the last game against Dagenham, it shows you curling one in with his left foot from the edge of the penalty area. Here he's striking one in with his right foot, albeit a free kick from the edge of the box into the top corner. Uh, some unbelievable finishes. I mean, I've forgotten half of these, but I mean, they, that's expected of me now at my age. So You're doing better than Brian Morton, who couldn't remember <laughs> a single game last time. So you're doing better than Brian. <laughs> Just remember being so cold. I took my son, who must have been seven or eight at the time. Um, yeah, it was freezing, was frozen there. solid. Bless him. Yeah. My wife was furious when I get when I got him home. <laughs> but yeah, we won, so that's good. Pneumonia is a good thing, right? Um, oh, what's uh, this? It's Here we go. Hello, Jordan. Hello, Jordan. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Have you got the whole game or just one moment? Just one moment. Go on, Jordan, here's your moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go on, talk us through it, young man. Um, I think that was the second time I got the ball in the game. Um, I remember being in the tunnel before the game and I'd been involved in the first team at my parent club at the time, at Fulham, but I hadn't played or anything like that. And... Uh, this was the first time that I was starting a game in professional football. I remember being in the tunnel and just like so nervous. I felt like I was going to faint and I'd never felt an, anything like that before. It was weird. But as soon as I came out on the pitch, like those feelings just went completely. Um, and I think I got the ball. I think Jake Wright, um, Skip, he, he gave me the ball straight from kickoff or something. And I've like wrapped one down the line and I think Hiltz ran onto it. And as soon as I got my first pass in, I, I, I was settled. And then that was about four minutes in that goal. You know, the ball came out and I just, I knew the boy was going to flick it around the corner. He didn't even look. So I stepped in. My first touch was a bit heavy, but I managed to play the one-two with Lunny. And then, yeah, I just hit it. Do you want to watch it again? Yeah, come on, let's watch it again, yeah. <laughs> I still look back at it now and I, I wonder why I hit it, but it just sat so nicely for me. Yeah, so. that's a great first goal to be fair to you. Yeah, you look, yeah. As, you look as though you've cut across the ball there as well, Jordan, which I didn't realize on the night actually. But it, yeah, yeah. It, to be fair, when like I can still see it in my head now, and the ball started off sort of centrally and just ended up yeah. sort of swerving yeah, away. Quite deep, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, so fantastic. Thanks. What have been said to you because you were playing for what Fulham's under 21 sort of thing? So this was a, a big yeah, one. What was yeah. said to you about the loan? Or what was what, what was behind the loan for you personally or for us? Um, so I'd wanted to go on loan from, well, from, from the beginning of, well, from the end of sort of last season. Um, and I just wanted to get first team football. I was 20 at the time, I think. And, you know, as a young footballer, you, you see lads around you at like 18, 19 playing first team football. And all I wanted to do was play first team football. And I turned 20. And I remember I was on the bench for Fulham uh, when I was 19 and I was hoping that I was going to get on. And I ended up not coming on. And then I got my, the, the low move to Oxford came about. Um, 
and I didn't really speak to many people at Oxford before going there, but everyone I'd spoke to who had been involved with the club, I spoke to Ryan Williams, um, who you'll all be familiar with. He was at Fulham at the time and he said it was an amazing club. Um, and my agent at the time was, you know, speak, spoke very highly of the gaffer, Michael Appleton. Um, and I just thought, yeah, perfect fit sort of thing. And obviously Oxford were flying. And I remember my agent saying to me that how Oxford, how well Oxford were doing. And it would probably be one of them where, you know, I went and I'd have to work my way into the team sort of thing. And that was fine with me. You know, I just wanted to be involved with a first team environment day in, day out. Um, and that's what happened. I, I came came to Oxford and I spent, well, I've, obviously I said before, my first game was Hartlepool away. Um that was a good experience, you know, it was, it was, that was proper men's football, proper professional football. Um, I think we won 1-0 that day. Yeah. And yeah. then I think I came on the weekend after we played Forest Green in the FA Cup and that was my debut. I came on for 20 minutes against them. I think we were 3-0 up at the time when I came on and did all right when I came on. Um, I, was, I was happy with how I did and then started a couple of days later against Yeovil in the Cup. So, uh, yeah, it was a bit of a whirlwind really and, you know, that was... That goal was like the best feeling I've ever had at that time. So, yeah, it's awesome. Were you surprised at the, at the quality of the team? Yeah, I was actually. Yeah, um, if I'm being completely honest, I was. I was wasn't surprised in terms of like I didn't expect good players because I expected good players, but I didn't expect them to be that good, and I didn't expect the football that we were playing to be as fluid. You know, um, I think a lot of people in football now talk about you know academy football where it's all like play, 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 pass at every opportunity. Um, but when I came to Oxford, we played really, really good football, but the lads could mix it as well. Um, and I just thought it was uh, the, the perfect balance, you know, like Jake Wright, who's, I called him Skip when I was there. I didn't even know his name for like two months because everyone called him Skip. Um, he was just the best person I've ever met in football. He was amazing. I, I can't speak highly enough of, of him, you know, as soon as I came in, he, he helped me with everything and as did all the lads. Um, so yeah, it was it was just really, really good environment to be in. And as I say, that the the football that we played at the time, um, whether I was involved in it on the pitch or whether I was, you know, on the bench at times and watching it, it was it was really, really good stuff, like really good you're stuff. You're dead right about Skip as well. Jake would look after someone like you coming in, make sure you're settled, probably yeah. you up at his house for the uh, for a couple of nights. He had time for everybody. He's a brilliant captain, wasn't he? Yeah, he was fantastic. Yeah, he was really, really good. And what was Michael Appleton like? We haven't really mentioned him so far on this on this pod. What was he like as a manager? He was fantastic with me. Um, different manager to, to anyone I'd experienced before. Um, he was absolutely brilliant with me. He, ke he came in and he always had time for me, like every sort of couple of days or every week, he'd, he'd always pull me and have a chat with me about certain things which he felt I could do better or things that he wanted. So, you know, I never went out on the pitch and... And Faz was the same as well. And I never went out of the pitch, like not knowing what my job was. Um, I remember the, the one time, because as, as a left back, I was I was sorted going forward, really. All the attacking side of my game was, was okay. But defensively, that was where I needed to get better. And that was where I needed to be stronger. And I remember the gaffer saying to me, told me, and he, he said that I needed to, he said, just get tight, as tight as you can to people. And I remember taking that into that Yeovil game and I played against the winger. I can't remember what his name was. Um, but I remember just getting tight to him in the first five minutes and he like let one run through his legs and it went out for a throw in. And subconsciously in, in my head, I thought that's happened because I got tight. That's what the gaffers told me, you know. Um, so I just kept doing that and, and tried to do it as best as possible, obviously. So he was really good to me, really good to me. The thing I remember, Faz, is um, you would travel back to your home and he would travel back up to Preston after home games. You'd travel up together, wouldn't you, and kind of analyse the game and talk it through? Well, there wasn't much analysis. If we won, we'd have a little bit of a chat. If we'd lost, neither of us spoke for about <laughs> an hour. And the would be Jess, his wife-to-be in the car at the back, sort of trying to make small talk. <laughs> what should we have for lunch tomorrow, Michael? And all this, that and the other. <laughs> so, yeah, but, but it did give us an opportunity at times, obviously, because we were travelling together to, to have, you know, discussions away from the, from, the, from the football environment in terms of your working environment and just have time with each other to sort of sit and 
discuss things in depth and 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 and, and come to some sort of conclusion, you know. Um, so it was it, it it was good in that respect. But obviously, you know, when you get things, when you get momentum in football, it's 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 strange how you know things tend to look after themselves. And as Jordan was saying there, you know, you got your opportunity in the side, and if you know you were brought into the team for because of the strengths, of course, we wanted to improve the weaknesses, the odd little weaknesses. But 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 basically speaking, it's people playing to the strengths. And one, once we got the ball rolling, then we didn't have to take some stopping. Talking of which, do you remember this game? Was this New Year's Day, I think? Yeah, it was a pivotal yeah. game, wasn't it? Because we could easily have lost that one, could have lost the momentum, I think. But Danny Hilton's ability to win a penalty. So this is the Notts County game for people who are listening to the to the podcast. Uh, we were one 0 up, then two one down, with not particularly long left. And I was listening to the game, convinced that this was our wheels coming off, um, and then suddenly it all turned round. I mean, that's a hell of a goal by nice. Tom O'Dell there. Yeah. Was that the Hoobernator again? I think it was. Yeah, it? that's him. And another unbelievable strike by Roof. Yeah. Just remember, you're setting yourself up for a fall calling yourself the Hoobernator, aren't you? So... I think this was the game where I was actually convinced we were going to go up after this game. Mm. These are the fans singing afterwards. We're going to win the league. We're going to win the FA Cup and the JPT. <laughs> Some optimism there. It was ironic at the time. Ironic at the time because Daryl, the chairman at the time, he, he sort of adopted that song and came into the dressing room nearly every week singing it. So it was sort of almost subconscious, rammed down our throat. <laughs> Who wants to talk about this one? Faz, what do you remember about this day? Oh, we should say for the podcast, this is uh, beating Swansea in the cup. So, Faz? Yeah, I mean, these are days that, you know, lower league players dream about, absolutely dream about. We went one goal down early on uh, and you're thinking, oh, Christ almighty, let's not get turned over four or five. And then we worked our way into the game, uh, got a penalty. Um <laughs> Made it one apiece, I think. Yeah. And then from then on again, you know, we, we were sort of playing on even terms. And a fantastic strike again from Kimar, again coming in off the left hand side, um, put us into the lead. But again, a fantastic day. And like I say, you know, for a club that's got designs on promotion, you get a little bit worried that you get carried away with, but I just think that you gain momentum winning games of football, whether that's in the league, within the cup competitions, whatever. Um, and certainly this was another game that gave us belief and in no way did it hinder us in terms of what we were trying to do in the league. And of course, from the supporters point of view and everything, it just gives everybody the belief that, yeah, we've got a team that's actually got the um, ability to go places and it just sort of rubber stamped it for me um, fantastic performance to beat a Premier League team as they were at the time weren't they Jordan um, yeah, yeah. at home fantastic fantastic occasion uh, great result Martin. another question for the quiz yeah um, so before the Swansea game when was the last time that United beat Premier League opposition and uh to get the point, I want both the year and the opposition. Martin, you must assume that everybody's older than me in this quiz competition. <laughs> it wasn't that long ago, was it? Um, I was well, there. I, 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 don't, I don't want to say, do I? Because I'll give, give it away. But I mean, the clue is it's Premier League. So obviously it was post-1992. That's a bit of a clue. Hang on, Dan made the graphic and now he's writing answers down. I mean, he's had time. I was there, I, I was there at, this, at the game that we won. I was probably there, but... I haven't got a clue. <laughs> oh, 
Conway, who would we? I can't remember what year it was, though. I have no idea. Anyway, it's a good question. Well done, Martin. Go on, skip us forward to this next game. What are we doing here, Dan? Uh, we are away at Portsmouth. We never and win at Portsmouth. Surely we're not going to win this game. Danny Hilton spends a lot of time up in the air, doesn't he? Down on the ground. And then on the ground. <laughs> oh, he's hurt. That might be the end of it. Hang on. He's patted his hair down. He's up. I'm going to say something controversial here. Liam Serkin was a terrible penalty taker, like really, really terrible penalty taker. There must have been like people queuing up to, to take the penalties off him, Faz. Maguire would have been. There was, there was, there certainly, but I think he must have had something in his contract, which I wasn't aware of, so no. don't be carry on with it. <laughs> I mean, he was rubbish at them, right? I'm not, I'm not just making that up. They always seem to go straight down the middle and like double pick yeah. a lot of the time. No, I mean, uh, and you get, uh, and Jordan will bear me out on this, you get some people that just have the good fortune that somehow, however they take the penalty somehow, they'll, 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 they'll end up in the back of the net and not striking the ball particularly cleanly. And sometimes by not striking the ball particularly cleanly, it sort of, throws the goalkeeper a little bit and you get other people who strike the ball really, really well, but the goalkeepers read it and, and, and manage to make the save. I couldn't say that uh, Liam was one of those that struck it really well and the goalkeeper made the save because he didn't. But uh, yeah, I mean, we had one or two penalty takers or people who fancied taking penalties at that particular time, but for, what, for whatever reason, he had the job. Jordan Barry came off the bench that day to score that the winner, didn't he? Yeah. 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 He was a good player, Jordan Bowery. The thing that I think about this team is every time you know we're on the good run, or we, we just seem to make the team stronger all the time with our signings, and Bowery is a really good example of that. Yeah, well, I think what we tried to do obviously was you know look for a certain type to complement the players that we had. Unfortunately, when you're when you're on a good run and you're doing well, then it's a lot easier to attract those players. Um, you know, they've got they're proactive in wanting to actually come and join you, which makes life a lot easier. Um, obviously, when things are not going quite as well, to get the players that you need to get you uh, going forward again is sometimes a little bit more difficult because, you know, they look at where you are in the league or the position or the way you play or whatever. And, and you know, not for me. Um, but at that, at that particular time, you know, if Lionel Messi was available, he probably would have come and joined us. That <laughs> exaggeration. I, know. Sorry, really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like the, the team at the time I've obviously you had Rufi and who was scoring brilliant goals and, and things like that. But I felt every single one of the, the, the team at any time never felt like we were going to lose a game. And I felt like if it wasn't Rufi who would dig you out, it would be Hiltz. And if it wasn't Hiltz, it would be, you know, Jordan Barry came off the bench and scored that one. I felt like we had a lot of players who were able to dig you out. If you needed a goal, someone could do it. If you needed someone to throw themselves in front of a shot. You know, we had Mulls, we had Skip, we had Shea Dunkley, who would all put their bodies on the line. And I, I just felt like we had, we had a team of players who could really, you know, grind out a 1-0 win, beat a team 5-0. And, you know, just as Faz said before, I think it was a team for, for all seasons, really. I had a bit of everything. Uh, so. your, your first game that we've already, you know, the, the one at Hartlepool was a 1-0 win, wasn't it? That was yeah. a game and... You know, difficult conditions, windy day, wet, Very, hot, yeah. and you know, you, you know, you, your mindset has to be right before the game. Unfortunately, when you're winning games, it's it's a lot easier to find that mindset. You know, so skipping on a little bit, the, the JPT run was that a distraction at all? Me personally, I just thought it just added to the momentum, you know, and kept um, everybody in the squad involved. You know, you were able to give. Um, players who might not have played regular league games, an opportunity in these games. And of course, the nearer you get to Wembley, the one thing you want to do is actually, um, you know, play there and play in the final. Um, and ironically, I thought actually it was the game after the Wembley game that probably um, where we suffered a little bit rather than the games leading up to it. I think the games leading up to it, it just continue to build the momentum and, and and give us the confidence that the team needed to just keep on playing and doing the things that we were doing that were making us 
you know, such such a um, successful side, and the, and the cup runs uh, both in the FA Cup, the League Cup, um, and obviously the uh, the Johnson's Paints or whatever the trophy was that season. You know, I think these games helped us build momentum, um, and the players really, really looked forward to them. But I don't think in any way it distracted us from the main get the main aim, which was obviously to get promotion. The semi final. Had we beaten Millwall in the semi final? Yeah, yeah. two legs. Favorite memory is beating Millwall at the home game. I think we drew the home, the second leg, and I remember everybody sitting in the bar afterwards till very late at night. And Kemar Roof as the DJ, and that was brilliant. Do you remember that? I remember that. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think that went on till about three or four o'clock in the morning, didn't it? Yeah, definitely. It was great. It was the, one of my favourite, because the party after this was rubbish, by the way, but the party after Millwall, the impromptu one, was great. Jordan, yeah. you, you talked about, you've come to Oxford, you've had your senior debut, you've scored a tap-in against Yeovil. Then suddenly you're playing in front of 56,000 people. Look at the, you nearly scored there, didn't you? What was going yeah, on? I looked young there, didn't I? Wow. Um, yeah. What was the experience like for, you know, somebody oh, start, start to, Well, I say start to finish, obviously, Losing the game was absolutely devastating because I felt, I really did feel like, especially first half, we were the better team. Um, and I felt like, because Barnsley obviously went up to the championship at the end of this end of this season, but I felt like we were, we could have won the game sort of thing. Um, I, I just think that, that the whole, the whole build up to it, the, the lead up to it and everything was fantastic. You know, I remember going to, um, I can't remember what it's called now, but we went to a place down in High Wycombe where we'd been training a little bit. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So we stayed there for a couple of days before the game. And, you know, I've all, I've always said to anyone I've spoken to, the Oxford dressing room, so the change room, the, the team I was involved in at Oxford's the best I've ever been involved with. Like, And I remember Macca saying to me one time that he said, it's only the second time in his whole career that he's had a changing room where, you know, everyone gets on and everyone's like mates as well as, you know, a brilliant team. He said it doesn't come around a lot in football and it was my first time in a first team environment and to have that experience with everyone where I just walked straight into a side where, you know, everyone was was so close. I think that made our run up to Wembley better um, and, and obviously the day itself, walking out at Wembley was, you know, I said before that the goal I scored was the best feeling I ever had but I think walking onto that pitch at Wembley was something that will never be topped, really. Um, I, I, I think there was about 60,000 people there, was there? Um, you said you, it, you said you nearly fainted against Yeovil at home. God, yeah. I had a feeling when you walked out here. Uh, I, was a bit, I was all right then because I'd, I'd made my debut and all the rest of it. So I was, I was you know, I knew what to expect and stuff. But I think it was more surreal. I, was, I, I remember being in the tunnel and I was not nervous one bit, which, you know, might be strange for a, a game of a cup final at Wembley. But I, I just remember walking out and thinking this is what I've dreamt of, you know. Um, and I remember playing in the first half and I, I, I felt like I was playing really well in the first half and I, I can just remember wrapping passes into into Rufi and, and Hiltz up front and um, obviously Callum scored and I, so, so hard to describe. But when we scored, the place was so loud, but it was like silence as well, if that makes sense. I was running towards Callum to celebrate and, you know, it was it was just a mental feeling to go 1-0 up at Wembley with thousands of people screaming and yeah. it was just yeah. crazy. But yeah, it was an awesome day. I was obviously devastated not to not to win the win the final because I felt we could have won it, especially when we scored. I think Hilt scored a header um, to put it 3-2 and I felt like we'd go on and, and, and nick an equaliser and maybe push it to extra time, but wasn't to be you know and after the games all well as soon as the game finished it's all a bit of a blur then because you know it's it's over but it was um an amazing experience for me nonetheless yeah i think the thing about it and and and, and i think jordan would probably agree with me, is the fact that though we didn't win the game we did ourselves justice and yeah. um, there's there's an element of disappointment after the game that you know, you've got to Wembley and, and you've lost the game. But we're playing against the team that ultimately, you know, got promotion. Um, 
it didn't stand in the way of what we wanted to achieve. And, and, and from that respect, you know, eventually you look back on it in hindsight as a great occasion, you know. Um, but certainly we didn't disgrace ourselves on the day. I thought, you know, the performance was excellent and, and we were just shaded by a side that might have just have had that little bit of luck against us on the day. But again, I think it showed the quality of the team that we had, that we gave a side like Bar uh, Barnsley uh, such a, a good run for the money. And, and certainly it was, uh, in terms of a, a game of football, a, a good advert for, you know, lower league football. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And the fact that, you know, there was almost 60,000 people, there were 60,000 people, it was absolutely fantastic day, other than the result. I remember, I remember after the end of the game, the gaffer said something which I thought was was brilliant at the end of the game. Um, obviously, we were disappointed not to win, but the, the the dressing room after the game, the the talk we had wasn't exactly downbeat. But I remember the gaffer saying, "He said, make sure we're not back here in six weeks' time," because I thought that was just so important. Because obviously, we wanted to get promoted, and the aim was automatic promotion. There was no way we wanted to go through the playoffs. Um, and that was what he said. He said, use this as motivation. You've been to Wembley once now. We don't come back here in six weeks' time. We go and, you know, get automatic promotion. And I thought that that resonated really well with the lads. And obviously, as it went, that's that's what happened. So, The final question of the quiz. Um, uh, to the nearest thousand, apart from Wembley games, what's the largest crowd that Austin United have played in front of? And who was it against? So, um, but you get an extra point if you can name the exact date. People playing along at home, good luck to you. Yeah, good luck to you. There's no prize, so don't feel too bad if you don't get it right, you know. There's the... no prize. Go and get a prize. No. Martin, what have you been on all night? I mean, where do you get these questions from? <laughs> uh, Jordan, you're a hairdresser. What can you do with Martin's barnet? Can you... Yeah, come on, Jordan. Give me a, give me a virtual haircut. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could. Um, work anything with that. There's got to be more... This well, I've got to guess this question. Yeah, right. Uh, so I repeat it for those listening on the pod. To the nearest thousand, what's the largest crowd that Oxford United have played in front of, not including matches at Wembley? And who was it against? And for a bonus point, what date was it? There's a lot of bonus points in this quiz. Yeah, <laughs> I'd drop it out somehow. Um, Back to the football, quick, get away from the quiz. Ah, uh, yes. We took a million people to Carlisle away uh, this day, didn't we? This is, a, what do they say? Limbs, I think, is what the kids of today say. <laughs> Liam Serkin scores the goal. Limbs. It took me five hours to get to this game from London because the West Coast train line wasn't running that day and I had to do a really kind of circular route by train to get there. I wasn't sure how I was going to get home afterwards because there, there was no train back. I managed to kind of hitchhike a lift home. Well, ironically, I think this is the only time we've used the train when yeah. we went to Carlisle that day. But obviously, we would, it was the bank called the weekend, wasn't it Easter? Yeah. But we went the day before. We went right. on the Friday, or if this game was on the Friday, we went on the Thursday. But we actually travelled on the train. This was the famous day of the free hot dog, wasn't it? Yeah, Daryl offered free hot dogs. Uh, uh, they, they scouted out. I think Cheryl went all the way up to Carlisle, trying to sleep to the pub, and uh, gave away a free hot dog to any fans who want to go in there. But it was a massive must have, There must have been a beer involved in it as well. <laughs> I got to the pub and the queue was so long to get either a beer or a hot dog that I got neither. <laughs> it was a pub around the corner with no free beer or hot dog, but you could get served. So, yeah, it was great. It was such a good away day and such a great performance and such a great win. Um, yeah, it's just an amazing, amazing day out. Were you nervous at all, Faz, towards the end? Uh yeah, of course, you begin, you begin to have a little bit more anxiety before the games and you're hoping that, you know, the things that you've sort of done in the early part of the season, when it really comes to the nitty gritty towards the end of the season, um, are the lads capable of, you know, um, keeping their emotions and, 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 
and sort of playing under that sort of pressure. And I think the fact that quite a few of these players have actually gone on and played at you know a higher level, uh, or some in the Championship, one or two in the Premier League, sort of um, gives you a little indication of you know how mentally strong they were at this particular time because you know we're coming towards the end of a long season not only in terms of the league games that we've played but we've had quite a bit of considerable uh games in the in the cup competitions as well but this is obviously the most important part of the year and it's important that you go away to places like carlisle and and get results and of course we never really faltered i can't remember a time when we thought Oh, it's going to be tough now. We know it was going to be tough, but we always felt it was in our control and the performances and the results were, were, were fantastic. Fantastic. We still needed loads of injuries at the time, though, didn't we? Um, I can't remember, to be honest. I can't remember. Was this the game that Joe Scars was kind of patched up? and I think he had had to sort of step back by at this point. He, he played a game earlier in the season on one leg and... We've done a podcast with Scarzi uh, earlier in this series, and he played a game he shouldn't have played, and it, it basically ended his career. Uh, Joe. Oh, Joe, Joe played all his games on one leg. So <laughs> no different than any other game. <laughs> yeah, I think I was I was injured towards the end of this season as well because I remember me and Scarzi got injured at the same time, and most of the season I was trying to get into the starting eleven. You know, behind Scarzi sort of thing, because um, yeah. he was so consistent, um, and you just knew what you were getting with him every single week. Um, he was brilliant for me to, you know, as a young lad coming up to the, the model professional sort of thing to to watch and and learn from. But I was trying to take his spot, and then just as it happened, we both got injured at the same time. I think I, I broke my rib at Newport away, um, and and that was it. That was my season season done. Um, but I think I played maybe two or three games um, after the Wembley one when Scarzi was injured. I played maybe three games and I got injured in the third one. And yeah, that yeah. was just a... I think Scarzi was injured for the Wembley game, wasn't he? What's that, sorry? I think Scarzi was injured for the Wembley game, wasn't it? Yeah, I think he was. He was, yeah. well, he was carrying a knock for sure. Um, yeah. He was carrying yeah. a knock. Yeah. I think, as you said, I think he was carrying a knock for a while. But him being the, the, the sort of player and professional he was he just wanted to carry on yeah so. carry on yeah 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 by the time he got to the Wickham game at the end somebody had, had to move Josh Ruffles to left back that's never going to work Josh Ruffles playing left back whose idea was that Faz was that you well we were trying to trying to squeeze Josh in at that particular time I think the Wickham game you always you always find a way the Wickham game to finish it off needed a win to, to go up Big Shay was the man for the occasion, wasn't he? I mean, of all the people that we've mentioned today on the podcast, and we've never mentioned Shay, and what a fantastic character and, and and player he was on the pitch for. You know, at places like Hartlepool and uh, Carlisle and places like that, difficult to wave gowns. You know, they were. Him and Jake Wright were the rocks at the back that gave us the freedom to go forward and play. Uh, and obviously for people like Callum here, who's celebrating the third goal. Uh, fantastic game. The transformation of Shay Dunkley in basically a season where he went from bits looking like a player's really almost out of his depth into being this kind of colossus of a defender was amazing. Did you ever any, ever have any doubts about him, Baz? Were you? Well, not once I had to get hold of him and sort of um, start to take a little bit of notice. <laughs> no, I mean he he was he was a sponge was uh, was was Shay and and he come from you know non league football and he was determined to make the most of his ability and if you spoke to Shay he would listen to you and he would consider it and he would con he would then try and implement whatever you tried to. Uh, ask him to do and he was a fantastic person to work around and he had a wonderful a wonderful wonderful personality that was sort of uh, um, infectious and people used to like him because of that and if he needed help people would help him because 
they were getting the encouragement of, you know, that was his nature. And he was a fantastic person around the football club, like a lot of them were, and, and just got on with his job and, and tried to improve. And, and of course, eventually left the football club and, and has played for the last three or four years in the championship and made the absolute most of his career. And it's good for people like that because that's the sort of, you know, character and personality that you like to see make progress in the game. And certainly Shea's done that. The reason, um, Jordan, here's the reason when I talk to you about coming on here, yeah, scenes like this, the Wickham game, playing in front of 56,000 people um, at Wembley, playing professional football in a promotion winning season. Do you come on loan? Do you take this for granted that this is going to be your life from this moment on? Yeah, um, I think in the moment it's hard to hard to to, to grasp it for what it is. Um, and I've spoke before and, and said about being being a footballer, and there's so many highs and lows in the game um, that sometimes you don't appreciate the highs as much. You know they're absolutely fantastic, and as I said before, the the feeling of playing at Wembley and scoring my goal and stuff, and as I say, I was injured for this game, this this Oxford Wickham game, the the one where we got promoted. Um, but the scenes in the changing room after were just out of this world, and it's it's something I've still got the videos on my phone, and something I'll never forget for the rest of my, my life. And you, you you sort of like live it in the moment, but you don't appreciate it uh, as much. Um, and then you look back on it and you think, wow, what what a day, what what a weekend, what an occasion, what a game. Um, it's 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 a strange feeling because you know that the, the lows, like if I've ever had uh, a game, I remember the reverse fixture. So I came on against Wickham um, when we were away at their place, and we lost two one. And I give away a free kick, and then they ended up scoring from the free kick, and we lost the game two one. And that was like the lowest. Um, and I thought about that a lot more than I probably thought about the highs. You know. Um, so I think that's just the way football is. But, you know, looking back on memories and stuff like that, these are the moments that you remember, the, the promotion, the goal, the Wembley, the, the, the last day of the season, this. These are the moments you, you remember after everything's happened, not the, not the low stuff. So, yeah. You've spoken really well and you, you've done a, another podcast, a less, less good podcast. Yeah. Um, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think the thing about it is, is that, and, and you've experienced it and I've experienced it as, you know, athletes, the, the misery and disappointment of a defeat lasts three, four, five times longer than, you know, the euphoria of a victory. Absolutely. But obviously, promotions are a little bit special because it stays with you a little bit longer. You've but you ask any athlete, any athlete about a defeat or what stays in the mind the longest, and it's always the defeat, always the defeat. You, um, Jordan, I wanted to ask you, you did a, the, the podcast I was saying about it, the, the, the adjustment from days like this to, well, explain for the fans at home, what, what are you up to now? And explain a little bit the adjustment you've had to make. Okay, so now I'm currently a barber. Um, I've got my own barber shop. For Oxford United fans, you'll know Mark Crichton, who played centre half for you. Uh, he's actually got a tattoo shop in Wrexham and my barber shop is inside his bar inside his tattoo shop so small world um so me and mark i sort of work with mark now um but yeah so i'm a barber now um i stopped playing professional football 2017 i signed for wrexham after i left oxford um played about 30 games for them and i turned down a deal there almost a bit naively i suppose um it wasn't uh, it, it just wasn't for me at the time. Um, I thought I'd get another club or I thought I'd go elsewhere and it, it just never really materialised. I went on a few trials and got offered the odd deal here and there. But again, it just it just never materialised for me like that. Um, and it took me a while to come to terms with, you know, I, I ended up signing part-time. I signed for for a team in the Welsh Premier League, Ballatown, and I never committed to a full-time job or anything like that because I still thought I was going to be a footballer or I'd get back to, you know, where I wanted to be. Um, I was probably 22 at this time and I think a year to the day um, I played at Wembley you know uh, April 2016 and a year to the day later I was playing at Rill which is in North Wales 
um, in front of maybe two, three hundred fans. And it was just the, the transition was crazy. Um, and at the time, it was hard for me to deal with, you know, how I'd gone from the highest moment of my career to like to a, to a, to a lower point, you know, in, in the space of a year. And I ended up sort of going on trials and, you know, trying to get back in the game for a year or so. And just it just never really happened. So I thought, right, you know, put it to the to the back of my mind for a minute and let's focus on something else. And funnily enough, for anyone who's listened to my previous podcast, the reason I'm actually a barber, I owe everything to Alex McDonald from Oxford, um, which is mental because I remember we were, we had someone come in to talk to us about life after football when I was at Oxford. Um, and we had to do a, an exercise at the end. We had to write down what we wanted to be after football. And I was 20 years old, you know, in the first team environment, I didn't really listen that much. I thought I'm going to be a footballer for 15, 20 years. There's no point in, in me writing it down, but I just, I think I wrote down PE teacher. And I was sat next to Macca and I said, what do you want to do after football, Mac? And he looked at me and he said, I want to be a barber. And I said, why do you want to be a barber? I didn't understand why he wanted to be. I'd never heard anyone say that. And he explained it to me and he was like, oh, I get my hair cut every week and I like being in the barber shop. You know, it's a social environment and blah, blah, blah. So that sort of stuck with me a bit then. And I, I became obsessed with the idea of it. And I looked into it a bit when I was at Wrexham and when I was at, towards the end of my time at Oxford. But I just thought I can't do it because I'm a footballer and all the rest of it. And then when the opportunity arose where I didn't really have anything to do alongside my, my part-time football sort of thing, I ended up going and training as a barber. Um, I did a course with the PFA. They helped me massively and retrained as a barber. And I must admit, I've, I've never looked back. I, I do think it's probably, you know, as much as I loved playing football professionally and I'd say at Oxford, I'm not just saying this because I'm on the podcast, but I'd say the six months I had at Oxford were the best six months I ever had in professional football. Um, it was just the best time, even though I didn't play probably as much as I'd have liked to, the experiences that I had and the games that I did play and the things that I achieved, you know, will stay with me for the rest of my life. In my barber shop now, at the side of my chair, I've got my Wembley shirt on the wall that's signed by all the lads. Um, people come in and, you know, some people who I don't cut their, who I cut their hair, they don't know my past and stuff. And they'll look at the shirt on the wall and they'll say, oh, who's that? And I said, oh, my, my shirt that is and they just don't get it you know they don't understand why I'm not still playing football or why I'm a barber or anything and it's just nice to be able to tell the stories and as I say I still get to play football now I play part-time um, in the Welsh Premier League and still get to play my games every Saturday go to training a couple of times a week and yeah my life's a little bit different now to the professional football world but I have no regrets in, in, in anything that I'm doing at the moment so yeah yeah. Like a new cut people's hair at the same time as Mark has given them a tattoo. Uh, well, Mark isn't actually the tattoo artist. He just um, owns the shop. Um, but oh, I could probably give it a go and try and do a little collab with one of them. <laughs> do you still keep in touch with any of this team, Jordan? Um, I still follow a lot of them on social media. Um, I wouldn't say that I speak to many of them regularly. I, at the time, me and John Joe were like, John Joe Kenny, we were, I'm sure Fazl remember, we were like inseparable at the time um, and we did everything together. You know, we stayed in the same hotel because we were both lone players and we did everything together. And the maddest thing is we, we, we had um, the awards evening on the Sunday night after the last game of the season, stayed over in the hotel opposite the ground and in the morning, it was the end of the season, we were free to go home for the summer. And I remember John Joe had got up early and gone back to Liverpool and uh, I rang him and I said, oh, have you gone? And he said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm gone, but I'll see you in a few weeks. He said, yes, I no worries. I haven't seen him since. And that's, that's the maddest thing. Like, I, I, we speak regularly, you know. Um, I still speak to John Joe quite a lot, but I haven't seen him since 20, 2016. Um, and that's probably down to the fact that, you know, he was playing in Schalke for a year. He's playing Premier League football now for Everton. And I'm working full time, so it's, it's a bit different. Um, I speak to Skip now and again. I've, I've, he follows me on my social media. He's always commenting on my, my my haircut posts and stuff. When I put a haircut up, he's commenting saying, oh, he looked better before and all the rest of it. So, um, yeah. Um, but other than that, I, I, as I say, I still speak to, still see the boys on social media. You know, that's that's enough enough for, for us, I think, to, to see how each other's doing um, and, and catch up now and then. So, yeah. 
Dan, if I can find it, there's a brilliant video of Alex McDonald at that awards uh, ceremony. I have never seen a drunker footballer. And yeah. I previously tried to interview him. So it all ended very well. As opposed to this broadcast, which is going to end badly, Martin, you better do the quiz answers. That's okay. So the answers are question one. Before the trip to Austria, when was Fox United's previous pre-season tour outside the UK? And to get a point, you know, say one of the opponents. The answer was the trip was to the USA in 2012. And uh, one of the opponents was Seacoast United. The other two were Seacoast United Phantoms and Seacoast United something else. But So Seacoast United will get you the bonus point. I'm sure Chris got both of those. Well, yeah, but yes, yes, I've got both of those. Yes, good. <laughs> Okay, I can sense a bit of cheating going on. Question two, when was the last time before the Brentford game when uh, the Oxford United beat Brentford? The answer was uh, 1996, uh, January, if you're interested, but 1996 will get you the point. Uh, Oxford won 2 1, and for the bonus point, Martin Aldridge, the late Martin Aldridge, scored both goals. Oh, I've got that Question well. three, during his time with Oxford, Pat Huben had two loan spells away from the club, where? Uh, you, get, you need both to get the point. The answer was Stevenage and Grimsby. Oh, I got Stevenage. I, I got Stevenage Grimsby. Well, yeah. I, didn't get Grimsby. I, I got Stevenage, but Mansfield was my other guess. But... That was mine too. That's so, uh, yeah. not that far from Grimsby. Yeah, to be fair. <laughs> Question four. The 5-1 win at Stevenage equaled United's best football league away win at that time. Who did they previously beat by the score line in that league? And for the bonus point, which other team did United beat 5 1 away during the 2015 16 season? Walsall. Uh, Walsall. Yeah, for the for, for first point, either Leighton Orient or Walsall. Get, a, get you the one point. And for Crawley. the bonus points, the other team that United beat 5 1 away that season was Crawley. Crawley, yeah. Crawley. yeah. I've got those. Cool game. Yeah. Did, did Richard Hill score four goals, Martin? Um, that it was did, the Walsall yeah. one, yeah. Yeah. Not the Crawley one. I still got it wrong. Yeah, well done. Uh, question five was before the Swansea game, when was the last time United beat Premier League opposition, year and opponent? The year was 1994, and the opponents, of course, were Leeds United. Got the year. Well done. Okay. <laughs> what about Everton? What about Everton? What about Everton in about 98? Joey Beecham scored. Uh, yeah, that might count as well. I'll give you that. I'll give you a point for that one. <laughs> that might count. That might be correct. Is yeah. Well, yeah. question moving swiftly on. Uh, question six. Apart from the matches at Wembley, to the nearest thousand, what's the largest crowd that Oxford have played in front of? And for an extra point, and who was it against? And for the extra points, were uh, the date. So, uh, anyone, if you get those, Newcastle last season. Yeah, Newcastle last season is the answer. The crowd was fifty-two thousand two hundred twenty-one. That's what I said. And for the extra point, what's the date, Chris? Can you remember the date? I remember you were really drunk the night before, Martin. I remember that, but I can't remember where January the 6th. 25th of January, 2020. I wasn't far off. I had no. Newcastle 17th of Jan. Oh, that's, that's good enough. I'll give you a point for that, two points for that. Yeah. If I've lost this quiz to Jordan Evans, I'm never going to do another quiz on here again. <laughs> that, was, that, was the, that was an educated guess. I knew the Crawley one, I knew the Stevenage one, and everything else was a guess. I've yeah. got four points here. Luke, how many points did you all get then? Dan, how many points did you get? Uh, four. Four. Christopher? Four. Jordan, how many points did you get? Uh, two, really. No, 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 no. You, you must have got more than that from getting them. <laughs> yeah, well, I got... You know, you said that I needed both teams of Pat Hoban's loan. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. One. So... Fair point. Fair point. Yeah, two, really. How many did you beat Chris by? I, I've only got two points, I think. Probably, I, I should get a point for taking part. Just, I uh, think just, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could pop around the corner and check Faz's answer sheet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> People at home, I hope you were more successful with that quiz. Um, we'll come back next week, or we'll see how we go with the timings on these. I've loved every minute of looking back at that season. I thought it was a fantastic season. Uh, Dan and Martin, you are the uh, the people who pulled all this together. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Faz, I'll see you in a minute. We've got to go and hunt for some lunch.
the chefs are in, so that's going to be bad. But thank you very much for that, Faz. Uh, and Jordan, yep. it would really be brilliant to see you back and, and talking to us. Next time we come up to Wrexham, I'm coming for a haircut, or yep. we'll take you to the game. Or yep. will you come back and see a game down here? Come down and visit us, will you? Absolutely, yeah. Of course I will. Um, as, as soon as uh, fans are allowed back in or whatever the restrictions need to be, then I'll be down for sure. Don't invite the beast. We're not allowing him to come back in. <laughs> uh, everybody else at home, thank you for watching. We'll see you next week.